Welcome back. We are joined by Buck Hornsby. And Buck, it's honestly a miracle you are alive, especially when we're talking about a serial killer who he shot at four men. Three of them died. You are so lucky to be alive. Do you ever yes. just sit back and take that in? You know, <clears throat> a lot of the story that was not told was the morning I woke up the, the day he shot me. I typically would jog and run at the same time on my property. But for some reason that morning, my left ankle from a football injury was bothering me. So instead of running and walking, I just walked. If I would have been running and walking, I would have been another probably 600 feet further up on my property. I was 62 feet from where he shot me. And I was a 16th of an inch from bleeding out where he shot me in my crawler. I would have been 20 feet from the road, and I wouldn't be here talking to you. Wow. <clears throat> so a lot of people don't know that. Wow. So, yeah, I am a miracle. Thank God. And does your ankle usually hurt? Uh, just when the weather changes. So that was a morning that it uh, it changed right after 9-11, and um, it was 9-12, and yeah, I vividly remember it. How thankful are you that your ankle hurt that morning? Very. Yeah, that, that was a, I think God had his hand on me that morning for sure. Take me to that day. <clears throat> well, I woke up in that morning, typically Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I would walk and jog around my property. And uh, so I, I woke up that morning and Ryan Sharp, I think what he was doing was riding around and just noticing people at certain times that were out cutting grass or exercising because evidently he knew my pattern, I believe. So that morning, um, it was just a typical morning, and I really wasn't even going to go out because of my ankle, but I decided to go ahead. And uh, I, as I rounded the corner of my place right by the highway, I just uh, I had some music playing in my on my phone in my right pocket, which was by the highway, and uh, I remember hearing a car just pull up, like whoom, right on the, right on you know the my side of the uh, of the highway instead of in the right lane in the opposite lane, and as I turned to the right, I heard boom and it hit me and I I guess I just dove to the left and then another shot <clears throat> hit me in the back. And I just blacked out for about, I don't know if it was 30 seconds or a minute. And, uh, I mean, I didn't see heaven, but I did kind of like everything went blank. I couldn't hear. And then all of a sudden I, I came to and I, I was covered in blood. I couldn't breathe. And uh, the first thing I did was there was a, I had a storage building by the road. I had just put there, to, I was going to be selling it. <clears throat> and I rolled under the building. And I started looking around. Of course, he shot me on my right side, and my right eye was, he put my right eye out. And um, I just started looking to see if, you know, he was going to come up to try to finish it. And uh, thankfully, he didn't. <clears throat> so uh, the first thing I did was I grabbed my phone, and he shot my phone. So I couldn't call anybody. So I, I got up, and adrenaline kicked in, and I probably ran I don't know, maybe 50 yards, and I hit the ground. I just laid there trying to catch my breath. So <clears throat> then I crawled about 600 yards to my, my a family member's home to get help. And luckily I made it. And They brought me to my uncle's house. These guys, these fellas were working on my cousin's swimming pool, and um, they didn't speak English. They just saw me covered in blood, and, and I said, help. And they put me in a truck and brought me to my uncle who lived a half a mile away and uh, <clears throat> called 911. The helicopter was in New Roads, so working a wreck, and then the closest ambulance was like 45 minutes, so we took off down the road. He, he, he I jumped in his, well, they put me in his truck, and a state trooper met us about probably um, five miles out, and we followed him to the Baton Rouge General, so... Of course, when I got there, it was like in lockdown, cops everywhere. They didn't know. They just knew a man got shot, didn't know if I was shooting somebody. Nobody knew anything. So when I got there, it was just, you know, they rolled me in and 
we'd started all the stuff, procedures and MRI, X-ray, everything. I remember when we interviewed seven years ago, you showed me you had, even though you were shot, what, twice? Yeah. Did Wasn't it one of those where you had just injuries all over your body from pellets? Yeah, 140, I believe, total that hit me. Yeah. I mean, your body was literally just full of pellets everywhere. It's amazing because I still have some in the pleurisy of my right lung. and I mean, that's like four inches in. And it's just amazing that it didn't penetrate this artery here. It just, it, I, I'm just, I know that the Lord had his hand on me. And when was this again? It was September 12th, 2017. Okay, so what, a week later, he went to Carol Breeden? I th- was it a week or maybe two weeks? Something like yes. that. I want to say September 19th. Okay, yeah, um, maybe so. And I know. Yeah, I think it was within dates. four to five weeks where he shot Carol and shot Mr. Devin Chesky. Yes. Right, right. I guess walk me through the realization in your head that what just happened. At what point do you sit there and start asking questions of what happened? Who did this to me? You know, <clears throat> when it when it happened. I really, you know, you soul search. You know, I was in business sales. You start thinking, you know, has anybody had a beef with me? Or, and I just, I couldn't, I couldn't think of anything that why well, somebody would shoot me. I mean, we live out in the country. We never hear anything like this, especially where we are. And um, so, you know, you kind of wonder. And <clears throat> of course, Two months prior or, or six, seven weeks prior, he shot Tommy Bass, Tommy Bass, who lived a mile and a half from me. I actually saw Tommy that morning at a local store about two hours before it happened, and I talked to him briefly. Been knowing him all my life. and um, So I did, get, I did talk to him that morning, but, you know, I guess uh, it was just, why did this happen? People, you know, did they weren't linked together, the, the my shooting and Tommy's, but it made me wonder, you know, I wonder if this had anything to do with him. And, of course, when Breeden got shot, then everybody freaked out, you know, around our area. So it was, you know, don't cut your grass right now. Don't do this. Don't do that. So it was, it was, a, it was serious. How bad was it for you, though? You've already been shot. Then there's this fear of don't cut your grass, don't get out. I mean, if you can even put that into words, what was September and October 2017 like for you? Well, once Carol Breeden was shot, then you're, you know, everybody says, Hey, this is, this is related. So there's somebody out there shooting people. So, I mean, you, you're riding down the road, you don't know if somebody's going to be riding by, and he know he knew what kind of vehicle I drove. He knew where I lived. I know nothing about this guy. And you're riding down the road, and you're thinking somebody could easily just pull a, a shotgun out, and as you're passing by, shoot you. Um, you know, my my girls and my wife they were afraid, so we uh, they actually moved uh, about ten miles from where I lived for about two weeks while this was going on because you just you didn't know. Every time you're pulling out of your driveway or pulling in a store, you're just constantly looking around trying to, you know, see if someone is there, you know, spying on you or whatever. You know, it was just, it was, it was a tough time. I had some nightmares and and things like that, but uh, I wasn't really fearful. I was more or less concerned, mainly for my family, you know. And but uh, yeah, it was it was serious. At what point did you realize it was Ryan Sharp who allegedly shot you? I had a call from the sheriff. He called me personally and told me they got him. And I, to, to my surprise, he lived four and a half miles from me. I'd never met this guy in my life. He'd been living there nine years. And um, 
the what is really crazy, and a lot of people don't know this, he was working for my cousin who lived a half a mile from me. And the week after the shooting, he was at his house saying, how's Buck doing? Man, this is crazy. He's packing a gun. My cousin's packing a gun. A guy's doing a sound system in his, in his outdoor swimming pool area. He's packing a gun. They're all talking like they're buds. You know, protect you, protect me. And there's Ryan Sharp right there with a gun talking to them like it's the worst things ever happened, like nothing. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. Right there. I mean, he, he had the code to my cousin's gate. I think he was the next one he was going to target. So you didn't learn it was Ryan Sharp until after he was arrested. Correct. And start gluing this together for me that in your head, what's going through you? Well, you know, I did not know him personally, never met him in my life. So, um, you kind of start wondering why would someone do this? He was a successful plumber. Um, I, I think a lot of people in the community liked him that, that had dealt with him through work and, he was a big rabbit hunter. I, I knew guys that hunted with him. I didn't know him personally, of course, but so he just seemed like a normal person. And I don't know why he snapped and did what he did, but you know, he lost it and he killed three men, and wounded me. When you say that, what does that sentence say to you? I'm just thankful I'm here. It's a miracle. It really is. It's uh. Every day I get up's a blessing, so I'm thankful for that. Well, I'm glad you're here with us. Um, take me to the trial that happened a few years ago. Um, of course, I went to the uh, Breeden and DeFranceschi trial, mainly to for the support of the families because it wasn't my trial, of course. And, um, you know, he... Um, I was when I pulled up to the courthouse first time I, I'd seen him. I watched him walk in, and you know, you know, things go through your mind, and you're just like, man, this guy needs to be. He needs he's he needs to get what's coming to him eventually. I would say, but so uh, <clears throat> of course we went in the courthouse, and just watching him and looking at him, it was you know, and here I am sitting in the courthouse, alive. These families are here. I mean, they're crying, they're mad, all these emotions going in every direction. And I was just there to support them mainly and because, you know, here I am alive, but it could have easily been my family going through the same things. And uh, I didn't allow any of my family to come to that. I wanted to be there by myself and kind of, you know, observe and check him out and just to see what it was like. And, uh, but it was, uh, you know, you you just don't understand why people would do something like that. It makes no sense. But uh, I guess when you allow your mind to go in the wrong places, it can happen. What about when a verdict came down, a guilty verdict comes down 11 to 1? What did that mean to you? Well, I, I was glad. Uh, of course, you know, there was it wasn't a unanimous decision. They changed the law. So it has to be retrialed again, and uh, you know it, it. It was it was. I was very thankful for the families, and uh, you know, I mean, what can I say? I'm I'm alive. I'm living. I'm thankful for that. So even though I I, I do not, I mean, I don't really. I don't like Ryan Sharp because of what he did, but I know that God. Uh, God's judgment is worse than any, any man could put on somebody. So I know he's going to pay for what he did. And, uh, you know, I don't hate him. You know, I, I know that he's – whatever happened to him happened and he lost it. I don't know if it had, was drug-related or what. But for sure he uh, he went in a, in, a, in a dark place to do what he did. But – um. I don't hate him personally, you know. I'm just thankful he didn't use a a, a 35 wheeling or a, a rifle round when he shot me. 
because for sure I wouldn't be here right now. It just, everything just worked out for my, for the best for me. It's like all the stars aligned to somehow save you that day. Yeah. I mean, your art, your main artery was missed. And despite two shots and 140 pellets, you're here among us today. Yes, it's a, it's a true miracle. Um, you know, uh, I know that I believe the Bible Bible says the steps of a good man or a good woman are ordered by the Lord. So I believe that, and I, I, I trust that he had his hand on me that day. So I believe he's got more things for me to do, so I'm excited about that. What are you doing? What have the last seven years been like? Well, as far as my personal life, I've been through a whole lot. I almost died of COVID. Uh, I lost my wife of, uh, in 2022 in a car wreck. So it's been a tough go, but you know, I have my family, my kids, I've got three grandkids now and uh, I'm just enjoying life. And I'm just thankful that uh, God's allowing me to, to live and every day is a blessing. I mean, it's just, it's just great, you know, to be able to, to, to live and to help people. That's what I like to do. Tell me about your wife. I know you were telling me earlier, y'all had been married 29 years. Yeah. Yeah, she um, she had had a surgery four weeks prior to her wreck, and um, she had 15 stitches above her belly button. And um, the week before the wreck, her and my girls were riding to a restaurant or something, and uh, they were like, "Mom, put on your seatbelt." And she said, "Well, it rubs my stitches." So <clears throat> the next week, when she got in that wreck, she she was not wearing her seatbelt. So that was what happened. I'm so sorry. Yeah. yeah. And what happened during COVID? I, 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 well, I got sick with COVID in, um, it was May of 2021. And I was out of town in Arkansas. And uh, by the time I got back, it had gotten real bad. And I went in the hospital with uh, double COVID pneumonia. They told, uh, my family that it was really bad and two days later i walked out the hospital went home (laughs) you need to go buy some lottery tickets (laughs) yeah you're right wow yeah so you cheated death twice yes yeah it was a miracle wow so what are you doing now you said a lot about helping people well, we do have a small church uh um i'm not the pastor but i I help my pastor out a lot and we we just help anybody that needs their utility bill paid. We've helped people with that. We've bought groceries. We've cleaned homes for widows. We do all kind of stuff like that. But basically, um, I'm a big white-tailed deer hunter. I've always loved to do that, and I have a 300-acre farm in Clinton. So I'm I'm uh, raising, breeding white-tailed deer, and I'm going to have a, a hunting preserve there. So I'm just enjoying that. It's really fun. That's awesome. That's awesome. What else would you say when it comes to Ryan Sharp? How did this man change your life? Well, I guess, you know, you get caught up so much in life about little petty things. And uh, and one thing that it, it did show me is that the, the, the little petty things don't mean anything. Life is so important just to be able to live every day. And, and uh, you know, to God give us each day that he gives us is just a blessing. And um, so I really do take things a lot more serious, just getting up and being able to be with your family and just enjoy life and and just thank God for that every day because every day is a blessing when you've been through what I've been through. And I think a lot of people do take that for granted. They do. Turn off that alarm and hurry up and go through the motions of life. And we forget to realize the fact that we're even breathing is a blessing in itself. It is. At the end of the day, your relationships with your friends and family and your relationship with God is all that matters because that's what lasts. Everything else is going to is going to be gone one day. You talked about Tommy Bass. Mm-hmm. 
What was that conversation that morning? Um, there was a, a small store, uh, one of the local stores we have in our area, and they serve breakfast. So I was in there picking up breakfast, and he was in there. And I mean, Tommy just he just had a a little small uh, gravel truck. He hauled gravel, sand, and dirt, and um, just a real nice guy. He'd give you the shirt off his back. And um, we just briefly, I just told him, how, asked how he was doing, how his business was doing. And he uh, just his normal self, you know, he's real nice and always moving fast. He was a fast moving kind of guy. And uh, basically, I just told him hello and asked him how he was doing that morning. And then two hours later, I get a call that somebody pulled in his, in his yard and walked up to him. Evidently, he, you know, he knew Ryan, so um, he, uh, I think he was shot from the back. So I, Ryan probably came up, and he was just doing something, not thinking that would happen, and, and he shot him. So I don't know. I've heard rumors that um, Tommy was, was – uh, Ryan was working on Tommy's truck. Now, I don't know if this is a fact, but they had kind of had some, you know – there was a little bit of, of uh, they were just not talking good. Maybe a little bit of a beef about him working on his truck and it was taking too long or he charged him too much. I don't know for a fact, but I think that had maybe something to do with what happened. I've heard that. What went through you to learn that Tommy Bass was killed? I couldn't believe it. Uh, you know, I know for sure this guy had no enemies at all. I mean, he was an, he gave his shirt off his back. Uh, it, that was just total shock. Uh, our little community, um, we, we just, you know, my, my family, I have a lot of my family lived close to me. And uh, it just was like, this is unbelievable. We didn't know if somebody from out of town had driven by, saw him, you know, pulled up asking for, you know, that's kind of what you would think. You would never think that a local would do what he, you know, what ended up happening. Well, talk to me about the, uh, was it fear? Was it anxiety after that? Or was it a, okay, this was random. This doesn't happen in our community. Was there a fear brewing after Tommy Bass's killing though? Um, I don't think it was fear. I believe it was just, you know, I was thinking a random shooting that maybe someone from out of town, you know, was passing through and saw him, and I, I don't know. But I don't think anybody was really fearful about, you know, what would transpire in the future. So It was almost after Carol Breeden died is when— That's when it got serious. That's yeah. when that fear kicked in for men should not be in their yards cutting their grass. That's right. Yeah, it— uh, when he was shot, it got really serious. They started telling everybody to watch your back. Don't don't go out in your yard unless somebody's out there with you. People were mowing grass with family members watching with 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 rifles and pistols to you know just in case something would happen. And um, I know that D. Franceschi, the morning he was shot, his wife begged him not to go out there. I think. I'm sure if you talk to her, she'll probably tell you that. And, uh, she told and us that. My dad actually pulled up five minutes later. Cops everywhere. I mean, he was still there when it happened. So my dad got to, you know, he, he actually got out of his car and walked up and was talking to the sheriff department, and it was terrible, really sad. He was a very good man. Him and Breeden were great men. So you knew everybody. I did. I didn't know D. Franceschi that well. I had met him a few times, but uh, and I knew Mr. Breed. I'd met him a few times, uh, but yeah, they were all just good, good men of the community. Do you ever just sit back and take it all in? Yeah, you know, when you of course the trial's coming back up, and it's just I'm sitting here thinking to myself, I can't believe it. You know, these guys are dead. I'm here and I'm thankful. I feel bad. For their families, and it seems kind of like it's it's just not real sometimes, you know. But it 
definitely was real and it happened. I don't know how many people have been able to walk away from a serial killer. And that is your life. Yeah. You're able to say that. What does that mean? Well, like I said, it's, it's, I'm very thankful. I'm, I feel very blessed to, to be here. And, um, you know, I, I know that I have faith that God protected me. You know, I'm not saying that you know, I, I feel terrible about the other three guys. I really do. Um, uh, why things happen the way they do, nobody really knows. Um, but I am a man of faith, and uh, I do believe that, you know, God watches out for his people. So what else can I say? I'm just thankful that, uh, that I made it. Do you ever fight survivor's guilt? Um, you know, not really, but I do, you know, like, especially like we're talking now, it, it when I start thinking about everything, I, you know, I'm like, why me and not him? You know, you ask those questions to the Lord and, uh, but I know that things, I believe things happen for a reason. Uh, why they happened the way they did, I have no idea. But I do, I feel terrible for their families because they're still, it's a thing that it never ends, you know. We're human. We can forgive, but we can't forget. You know, it's hard to forget. So it's, uh, I, I just feel for those families. Do. Speaking of that, how clearly do you remember that day for you? Oh, I, I can remember every every minute of it from the time I I saw that car pull up. Oh, and by the way, my right eye, I lost sight in my right eye after he shot me. And my, my sight came back uh, two days later. So I can I can see through my right eye now. So it was, that was, well, I actually have a pellet right behind my pupil. They, it's still there. Uh, they they can't believe I can see. It's a miracle. Wow. Yeah. In fact, now that you say that, I remember seven years ago when we interviewed, you had a patch on your right eye. Yeah, correct. You, yeah, yep, yep, yeah. I remember that. But even, wasn't it your home also that was riddled with pellets? The, the, the metal storage building was, yes. Had over 250 pellets. It went through the metal building through the insulation and through the sheetrock on the on the on the side I was on that side I was shot at. So yeah, and it I mean it's a miracle that it didn't penetrate this artery. I still it it doesn't make sense. Uh I've got pellets that lodge four and a half inches into my side and I mean this one it didn't penetrate it, so two of them, so yeah, it's hard to figure out. You don't think he was alone? I vividly remember when I when I heard the vehicle and it had a loud muffler. That's why I remember this. I heard whoa, and I as I looked, I saw the back glass, the, the behind the the driver's door. That back glass crack, and then boom, boom, that quick. So, so if somebody you... had to be driving that car, and somebody had to be in the back doing the shooting. Yeah, you know, there's no way it was one person. I mean, it, it would be so hard. Think about it. If you're driving. Roll the window down. It, I know for a fact if, if it would have been that way, I probably would have saw the gun. I, I might have been able to jump out of the way quicker, you know, because you have to stop, I mean, oncoming traffic because he pulled in the oncoming traffic lane right on the edge of the road so he could get closer to me. And and I would have seen the window at least, the road, or I would have seen the person in the car in the front driving put the gun out. That wasn't what happened. The back glass cracked and two and shots. And you saw that, though? Yes, I saw that. And so the first shot comes, and you duck after that? The first shot fired, and it hit me, and I, I guess I just dove to my left, natural instinct. And uh, then the second shot you know, hit me in my back and back of my head. And but how come we've never heard anything about a possible second suspect? I don't know. I don't know. I, I told the authorities that. I don't know why that wasn't pursued, but it, I, I'm, I firmly believe it was two people in that car. 
What are you hoping for for this upcoming trial? Well, of course, you want it to end. That would be the number one most important thing is to put an end to all this. And, uh, and you know, does he deserve the death penalty? I mean, he killed three men. You know, they they say that he won't get that because it's it's too costly for the for the um, for the, the the courts. So I know he'll get life probably times three, maybe four. And um, to me, that would probably be a harder tr- harder thing to deal with than than capital punishment. You know. If you can say anything to Ryan Sharp, what do you say? You know, I would ask him why. Why would you do something like this? What, what would What would make you want to do this? You know, what What purpose did you have in shooting and killing three men and trying to kill me? What Why would you want to do that? <clears throat> I mean, why would you? What 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 was going through your head? Were you taking drugs? What were you doing? You know, I don't think he's really. The few interviews I've seen they've had with him, seems like he doesn't really say a whole lot. He just kind of acts like he's not there. But he's there. The week after he shot me, he sat in a in that area with my cousin and another man. They all three had guns. He was asking them how I was doing. He said he couldn't believe this was happening in our area. Man, I'm scared to cut my grass. He's just acting like he's just a normal old guy. <clears throat> so... That's uh, you know, he plotted that, everything he did. I believe he, he plotted it. And isn't his dad a, a state trooper? I believe he's a retired state trooper. I, I I talked to his dad briefly in the courtroom, and he came up to me and apologized. And I said, "You don't have no reason to apologize to me." I said, "But your son, you know, he needs to pay the." penalty for what he did you know that's what's important look at these three families here they're uh, crying and you know all upset and and I said I I know it's your son but you know when you when you commit a crime like this you're going to pay a penalty and that's what needs to happen did he say anything he didn't say much he just kind of looked at me and he I believe he being in law enforcement he knew that was the truth but on the flip side he's a father too yeah he's a it's his son, and um, I, I don't believe they had the strongest relationship I've heard. I think they would just talk from time to time but never really spend a lot of time together. I don't know what kind of childhood Ryan had, if he was a, if he was a troublemaker or what, but um, I, I've heard that him and his father didn't have the greatest relationship, but I don't know if that's a fact. That's just what I heard. How did this man change East Feliciana Parish? Oh, it's, you know, it, it goes to show you that even in a small community, bad things can happen. You know, you hear about Chicago, and of course in Baton Rouge we have all these shootings, and and uh, no one's exempt. It can happen anywhere. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Um... Not really. I'm just uh, just thankful I'm here. Any closing message on life to all of our listeners? For to a man who's cheated <clears throat> death far too many times. You know, we're when we go through this life, we're going to have peaks and valleys. Everybody's going to go through it. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor uh, of a mega church or you're just a guy that works at the local Circle K. But one thing I believe is you have to have faith in God. And if you have faith in God, he's going to be there in a time of need. I believe that. He was for you. Oh, yes, he was. Yes, he was. Well, Buck, we thank you for joining us. We thank you for opening up and sharing your story with us. It's amazing how you've survived not once but COVID as well. And then even to have your vision back. Yeah. I mean, it all speaks for itself. I'm I'm truly thankful. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you.